And welcome back once again, ladies and gentlemen, to a brand new edition of The Safe Point. I am your host, Joker. I'm your co-host, Shepard. It has been a while since I've done one of these with you, my friend. You're looking fantastic. How are you doing today? Stop you, woo-woo, <laughs> or whatever the young people say. Yeah, no, I'm good. You're looking good too, man. Um, yeah, it's been some time, all right. Uh, I feel older. <laughs> Kept you waiting, huh? Oh, perfect. Perfect. And, and speaking <laughs> on that little catchphrase, we we have tackled some big, big topics on the save point. We've talked about the Final Fantasy VII remake. We've talked about... Uh, Hollow Knight. We've even talked about Soul Reaver, which is one of the most legendary games, in my opinion. Um, uh, but now we're going to be tackling something that's probably the biggest topic we've discussed on the save point uh, in a long time. Certainly the most complicated. And this is it. It's such it's it's such a, one of these titles that has a convoluted timeline. There's so much going on, fictional wise, non fictional wise, that kind of thing. So, what are we going to be discussing, my friend? Metal Gear. So, <laughs> and more importantly, though, we're gonna we're gonna break this this actual topic of discussion up into a, into uh, two or three separate videos. Um, the first chapter that we're gonna call it is the Blood of the Snake, which takes place in Metal Gear Solid Three, which is where the whole story kind of began. Um, primarily focusing on our main protagonist uh, with the code name of Naked Snake who would then become arguably the greatest anti-hero in all of gaming. He would He's up there for sure. He would become Big um, Boss. It's worth pointing out um, that this was one of the games when Owner and I were in college, and the Joker and I were in college. Uh, this was one of the games we bonded over. We, That's right. We, go we goofed about, we geeked out over. As a matter of fact, I, I just want to show off a little bit here. Uh, I have on my Vita there, Metal oh. Gear Solid 1 and the HD collection. My uh, God. That's, that's my shit. I have my original copy of Metal Gear Solid 2. What? My original copy of Metal Gear Solid 3, all still here. And of course, for some reason, I also own the novelization, Metal Gear Solid 1. It's not accurate at all. It's weird and it's wrong, and I kind of love it. Um, <laughs> weird, how so? It just, there's some inconsistencies with the story. Um, the, the plot kind of goes in some slightly different directions. Either be, even the beginning, there's different dialogue, different characters. Um, for the most part, it is a relatively accurate retelling, but just with a few minor directions along the way, I suppose. Uh, yeah. no, no, no worse than the than the Resident Evil novelizations, which introduced a whole new character called Trent, and that was a whole thing where they're like, "Oh, who's Trent? He's the guy who knows everything about Umbrella." He oh. Never appeared in the games. Um, so it's like a separate thing altogether, then. Oh yeah, it was their own thing. They were they were kind of written alongside the games a lot of the time, I believe. Uh, but that's not what we hear about. Resident Evil is a story <laughs> for another day. Don't you fucking worry. Resident Evil is coming. It is coming. Um, we promise. <laughs> we promise. The Resi franchise is coming. But we're going to tackle this guy right now. And um, so, Metal Gear Solid uh, Three Snake Eater was officially released on the PlayStation Two, coming to the to the to the console's kind of last lifespan. Um, it was released in Europe on March 4th in 2005. It's a stealth action game uh, developed and created by the master himself, Hideo Kojima, and published by Konami, of course, uh, back when they were working together. Unfortunately, their, their relationship, their working relationship has, has deteriorated rapidly. Um, Hideo Kojima is now off doing his own thing with Kojima Productions. Uh, he went off and did uh, Death Stranding, and now currently working on Death Stranding 2, I believe. Um, as well as an original project uh, for Xbox. Yes, um, that's right. Which he has not revealed any de details about, so this video is immediately dated in a good <laughs> way. I mean, I'm, but hopefully we hear more news about it, and that's something <laughs> else we can discuss in the future. <laughs> who knows? Maybe people who are watching this right now are playing the new title for the Xbox that uh, Hideo Kojima oh. is working on. Um, but with Metal Gear Solid 3, it's it's a strange kind of chronological order that Hideo Kojima uh, did his titles in. So we obviously had uh, Metal Gear Solid, which was released for, released for the PlayStation 1. Um, the whole Metal Gear genre originally started off on those very kind of primitive kind of consoles uh, back in the latter, the latter form of the late 80s to the early 90s. Um, you had Metal Gear and then you had Metal Gear Solid Snake. I think that's what it was. 
yeah just on that um so there was metal gear 2 solid snake and then there was another metal gear 2 developed as well on a separate system by yeah. a separate studio that's a whole thing um so kojima i believe i don't know the full story and, and i will i'd like to point out we're not going too deep into the metal gear games it's metal gear solid we'll be discussing um but metal gear 2 and another metal gear 2 came out uh with contradicting plot lines and Hideo Kojima I think was involved at one but there was another one that wasn't technically canon it's very unusual yeah it's um, a strange one it always reminds me of like, of what uh, Twin Snakes did the the re-release yeah. for, the, uh, for the Dreamcast where it was kind of they upped the sprites a little bit more they kind of made the characters look a bit better had more flowing uh, better concepts of the gameplay and things like that but Oh, yeah, Twin Snakes um, got weird. Oh, it was GameCube. Yeah, it was. It was. It was, it, a, it was the weird GameCube. One. Yeah, yeah. It was a uh, more Hollywoody, more action based than uh, like the Matrix, basically. Literally, I mean, if, if Solid Snake can backflip off a missile, look, anything is possible. Um, but Metal Gear Solid Three Snake Eater uh, kind of takes things back to its to the roots of the story with other titles that Hideo Kojima it was involved with with the Metal Gear series. Again, Metal Gear Solid, Metal Gear Solid Two. It was much more of an industrial kind of vibe to the game, wasn't it? It was more futuristic in a, in a sense. Um, the way I look at it is with Metal Gear Solid and Metal Gear Solid 2, there was always a roof over your head. Do you know what I mean? Like it was, it was, yes. you know what I mean? It was much more claustrophobic, very claustrophobic, which was the style that they were working towards. And they did a great job of it, of course. Um, but Metal Gear Solid 3 kind of went back to its roots and it is set in the latter part of the 1960s and um the game actually opens up with a voiceover from david hater who in my opinion is he is snake be it solid snake be it big boss david hater is the man i associate with the snake character it's not to say that Kiefer sutherland did a bad job with what he was given with ground zeros with what happened with the phantom pain but for me, and I'm pretty sure for yourself, Shepard, David Hayter is the guy, right? Yeah, you think of Snake, you think of David Hayter. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's one of those things he brought for, not you know, original Metal Gear Solid, 1998, I think it was. Mm -hmm. um, Solid Snake is this cheesy B-movie action hero. Yes. And it was, you know, with the corny one-liners and all this other stuff, and David Hayter managed to balance that almost comedic writing mm. with a serious espionage story and he just he, he he balanced it deftly i love him for it metal gear solid 2 even more so and then i believe his his personal uh his magnum opus of a performance if you want to get pretentious and i do uh was snake eater i love him in guns of the patriots but snake eater was his real shining performance for me because the thing about it is Solid Snake is very, as much as I love the character, he can be quite one note. Mm. You know, he's the he's the legendary soldier, the fatigued soldier. That's all he really is in the first two games, to an extent. But in Snake Eater, Naked Snake is mm. such a developed character. You know, he's he's a soldier, but he's a bit of a goofball. He's he, he believes in fucking Santa Claus. You know, like. I, I think David Hayter did that really well. Like he he balanced those great scenes of like serious dramatic dialogue as well as the yeah I believe it's Santa Claus. Just like what? I love it. I love him so much. He's a, he's a tremendous actor as well. I mean, and he's he's also uh, a, a very good writer. Uh, he did some of the work on the X Men movies, and um, he's he's constantly kind of dipping his toe into into other into other uh, narratives like that. Yeah. But I think it's it's worth to kind of for people who haven't played the, who, are, who aren't really familiar with the Metal Gear franchise there's a huge difference between Naked Snake and Solid Snake Solid Snake is a clone essentially of the perfect soldier who was then called Big Boss at the end of his career but just going on a point that you made there uh, Shepard I think the most important thing to remember is that during this time of when it's set Big Boss is a person he has human feelings. He reacts differently to how his offspring would react because they have they have been they have been grown almost from his 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 cells to create the perfect soldier. But we'll get to that at a, at a later stage in the video as to how that all happened. But I suppose 
the story officially for Metal Gear Solid 3 starts off um, just right after World War II, or about uh, maybe 15, 20 years after World War II. And a little text comes up in the beginning of the game, which says, uh, after World War II, the, the world was split into two, into two, East and West. This would mark the beginning of what was known as the Cold War. So while the world is still recovering from the most atrocious, the most bloody battles probably ever documented in human history, the superpowers in the world at this time were plotting against each other. And the three main superpowers at this time were the United States, Russia, and China. And they were kind of nitpicking at each other to see, well, they've got bigger guns than us, we need to bomb them. They've got more bombs than us, we need to gun them, that kind of thing. Um, but the story essentially starts off with a young um, CIA operative who is given the name Naked Snake. Uh, he is a CIA operative and he has been tasked to go to USSR territory in a place called Selinoyarsk to extract a Russian uh, scientist slash engineer by the name of Sokolov, who wishes to go over the Iron Curtain, so to speak, and defect into the United States territory. So as Naked Snake, uh, your mission is set. You have a team of operatives working behind you uh, who have been with you for a, a few, a good few years, I believe. One of them is a man by the name of Major Zero. That's the code name that he uses. And the relationship between Big Boss and, well, we'll call him Naked Snake for the time being, Big Boss comes towards the, the end of the story. Uh, the relationship between Naked Snake, or we'll just say Snake, and uh, Major Zero. It's hard to believe that in this story, they, they come across as old war buddies. They come across as people who can depend on each other, who have been through so many different battles, so many different, just really intense moments. They're, they're, they depend on each other. They know each other inside and out. How their friendship deterior, de like it, it, it just deteriorates so quickly and so rapidly. But in this one title, he has your back. He's the first guy on, on your radio that you that you are talking to, essentially, when you're landed in Selena Yarsk. And what I really did appreciate about the whole aesthetic of Metal Gear Solid 3 is because it's set in the 1960s, there was no sonar, there was no codec, which is what the Metal Gear franchise is known about. You were literally dropped into a jungle with a compass, a map, and a radio. That's it. That's all you have. So our story opens up with uh, Snake doing the first uh, halo jump, they call it, from an aircraft carrier. And you're given a brief as to what your mission is. You'll be dropped uh, a couple of hundred meters away from where they believe that Sokolov is staying, where he is being held. And you have to make your way in there on foot. Now, we will discuss uh, the, the other aesthetics of Metal Gear Solid and Metal Gear Solid 2 in the next, uh, the next video that, we, that we're doing. But what Metal Gear Solid 3 immediately introduces to the player is as soon as you land, you are enveloped by a forest. You're swallowed by a forest. And it almost feels like the trees are moving. The foliage is moving. It is you alone in enemy territory. Now, Metal Gear Solid is known for that, where you're put behind enemy lines. You cannot call for backup here. This is a one-man mission, but I think with Metal Gear Solid 3, you, you feel the weight of that, that, that feeling upon you, like, I'm by myself here. I have to pay very, very close attention to the surroundings that's going on here. I've got nobody at my back here. And Snake isn't invincible. He's one man. He's on this rescue mission because... Again, kind of going back to the, the point that I made, at this point, there was still a lot of tension between the superpowers, a lot of tension. So if Russia found out that there was an American spy or American operative in their area, it would be World War III. Straight away, it would be a huge conflict. But do you remember how good that game looked back in the day? Oh, man. Like, it was funny because MGS3 had at least for the franchise at that stage, you know, the characters were much more expressive in terms of like facial animations, the body movements, the motion capture. I believe it was motion capture, oh, earthquake. Um, but the jungle was, it was so alive. 
like you were saying there, it was you were, you were enveloped, you were completely just surrounded on all sides. And one thing I like at the beginning is immediately your what little gear you have is gone. It's trapped up in a tree that uh, your your backpack got stuck on when you were parachuting in, and you have to climb up the tree to get it. And it kind of very early on shows you you'll need to be somewhat resourceful. Uh, you know, you could, there's multiple levels to the environments that you're in, more so than say. Um, Outer Heaven or the Big Shell from Middle Years 1 and 2 because they were rigid structures you know they were buildings they were built a certain way Snake Eater while it did have some buildings in it which you know changed up the environment more focused on the natural elements so the ground was uneven um, multiple angles of approach for most scenarios uh, oftentimes you'd be placed in an environment you'd have a kind of a linear entryway and then it's kind of, here's your little mini sandbox. How are you going to deal with this? Are you going to go around the outskirts? Are you going to sneak past everyone? Are you going to work your way, your way through and farm for supplies? Um, are you going to... I know we're talking about graphics first, but I'm just, I think the graphics inform so many of these things really well. Um, and I'm going to touch on a bit more of this later, but I just loved the the sheer volume of options for dealing with encounters that you didn't have in previous Metal Gear Solid games. Not to say that they were restrictive, but this game just took that to a whole other level. Yeah, just going on what you said there, Shepard, that um, each each uh, each each segment or each screen of, of the forest is kind of like, you can either go on the low road and kind of crouch along, going through the grass, or if you wanted to take like a, a little mini hill and kind of survey your surroundings with the binoculars and things like that. And what I really do love about the actual game itself is you've got a good support network behind you. Um, I suppose the three main ones who stay with you from this this part and then the main part is Major Tom, who we've all we've we've just discussed. You have Paramedic, who kind of acts as your Naomi Hunter, Mei Ling kind of uh, callback to the to Metal Gear Solid One. You also have Sigint, who is uh, he would remind you almost of. Nastasha Romanenko from Metal Gear Solid 1, the weapons expert, the guy yeah. who knows you know, what, what tactic to use, what, what weapons to use in this situation. Um, but there's also another character who appears rather early on. You, you, you talk to her before you see her. And for me, you might agree with me on this, this is probably the one main most important character which the entire franchise is based around and she's called the mother of special forces she's called the uh, the joy she's called the creator of close quarters combat she is simply known by her code name as the boss and she appears on the codec frequency of 141.80 which is the same um codec frequency that master miller would appear on in metal gear solid one but she has trained snake she has molded him into being this taciturn this very adaptive warrior and you can speak to her rather early on in the game and she she kind of foreshadows a lot of what the game is going to be built around which i'm going to call it the 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 coin based kind of um concept of what the actual game is based around the choice and consequence basically uh, good and evil the duality of choice is is very very much highlighted in this game um so as you kind of progress through the forest and as you said you kind of retrieve your your backpack there's very very minimal items in this thing um it's very primitive it's really really primitive and i think it's that point where you when you come up into your first enemy who's patrolling about the place outside the uh the compound that sokolov is in your the player is kind of given a choice now where it's like how do you take your first enemy down? Do you sneak past him and run the risk of him catching you and radioing in, radioing in reinforcements and things like that? Do you take him out completely with a tranquilizer dart? Do you knife him? How do you go about doing this? I feel like for a game like Metal Gear, a lot of player choice is given in the first opening sequence. Do you understand Absolutely. what I mean? It sets the tone for the rest of the game. Uh, even depending on the difficulty you choose, I think you start with different items in a lot of ways. Like if you start on the very easy le mode, you have a thing called the easy gun. The unlimited easy. ammo as well, right? Yeah, it's an unlimited tranquilizer 
tiny little pistol, little reload after every shot, just to make your life a bit easier. Great for hunting as well, which you can do in the game. You can hunt animals and you can use them for a variety of purposes, not just like eating them, but you can, so you get a poisonous spider, you can throw it at an enemy uh, or use it as bait, mm. anything like that. Um, but yeah, like the, the wealth of options and even um, back on the support network you have, if you encounter a scenario, you say early on, you uh, when you see the first enemy in the game, Snake looks through his binoculars and he sees the um, hornet's nest. The, yeah, the hornet's nest uh, hanging around above, and he kind of smiles, and you're like, "Oh, I can do something here." But if you call one of your support crowd, they'll give you instructions like, "Oh, you can often do this, or you can do that." And if you pick up a new weapon uh, and call a Sigan, he'll tell you what that weapon is, and he'll give you like a huge, massive essay on the history of that weapon. Mm-hmm. If you uh, pick up a new animal or rations or something like that call a paramedic yeah. she'll explain to you about the, the animal like what kind of environment it generally lives in what kind of food it eats and of course a snake will always ask can I eat it because that's <laughs> all he gives a shit about uh, which actually leads me to another element of the gameplay is the introduction of the stamina meter you know so in previous Metal Gear Solid games you had health bar end of this game introduces the stamina meter general actions deplete the stamina meter uh you know hanging from ledges cqc that kind of thing but it also impacts how well snake recovers from certain injuries um, which I'll get. um uh just going uh, going on the point that you said there when you when you are capturing uh the wildlife around you if you wait too long and one of the items goes rotten and you eat it it depletes the the stamina the stamina bar down so if you're trying to aim down your your gun It'll it'll shake and and your your field of view will go a little bit blurry. So it, it comes across to me that although it is we start the game off in in a vast forest with flora and fauna, it, it feels very lived in. It feels very real. There's an, a more organic feeling to the actual gameplay itself. Even more so uh, later in the game when Snake gets an injury, you have to heal him. If he breaks his arm, you have to you have to put a splint in with the bandages, take a painkiller. It's the same if you get burnt, you have to apply the ointment and the bandage. And if you do the, the wrong thing first, you can injure him further. Yeah. Which is brilliant. Brilliant. For a game you can also of make him sick. Did, yeah, for 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 a game. Spin him around. Literally, you can also spin him around in the menu and make him yeah. puke, um to get rid of the but that could be used to get rid of the the the, the, oh, the poison. He's had the poison, yeah. Yeah, if if he eats something rotten, then it's poison he gets food poisoning. It's like you spin him around, make him vomit it out. Exactly. But for a game of its time, though, how advanced they were thinking about, like they, they literally covered all bases of this of this kind of gameplay, which is brilliant. Yeah. And um, I suppose once you kind of deal with your first enemy, you you meet Sokolov, who is a Russian scientist slash engineer, and he's burning these papers. He's throwing them into a furnace. And uh, Snake kind of approaches from behind and says, hold on, I'm a CIA operative. I'm here to get you past the Iron Curtain. And... Um, him and Sokolov have a little bit of a back and forth about why Sokolov wants to leave. There's some shady things he's been doing uh, in terms of engineering these mass machines that are, that have that have kind of sparked the interest of uh, the Russian military and things like that. And uh, then Sokolov says they found me, which is one of the Gru units, um, as you're trying to escape this compound. And it's actually rather funny because. Because Snake is kind of more adapted to the stealth kind of profile, he has his back up against the wall and he's looking around the corner and how the camera angle kind of focuses, Sokolov would just kind of peer out (laughs) and Snake would look at him and just be like, what are you doing? Just get behind me. Um, But... Great moment, actually. Sorry, before you go on. Great moment Mm -hmm. when you first meet Sokolov. It's a very subtle thing. So you're talking to Snake is talking to Sokolov and they're like back and forth. He's like, oh, you know, yeah, cool, cool. As you're about to leave, Sokolov says, by the way, your Russian is excellent. And you're like, wait, they've been speaking in fucking Russian this whole time? I never noticed that. Yeah, so it's it's one of those things. That, so you, they're speaking in English to the player. But Sokolov says, by the way, your Russian is excellent as they're leaving the compound. Yeah. And then you realize so the whole time they've been liaising in Russian. That's actually brilliant. It's a great little detail. I it's like obviously the that. player wouldn't understand this, and it's like it's a very common problem with media is that characters of certain like nationalities don't speak their national tongue. Yeah. You know, so why would Sokolov be speaking English to a CIA agent when everyone he's surrounded himself with is Russian? 
Well, he wouldn't brilliant. have a reason to be speaking English. Yeah. And I of course, know. Snake would do it to get Sokolov to trust him. It's like, I'm speaking to you in your language. Yes. Very so, good. It makes sense. It's, it's a great little detail. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't isolate the player either. Mm-hmm. It doesn't. It's not like blockading the conversation behind subtitles, which I don't mind, but a lot of people don't or don't enjoy. It doesn't break the immersive feel or anything like that. Exactly. Yeah. It keeps the it keeps the momentum of the story. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very very long story. It is. It's very convoluted, and um, I suppose <laughs> once uh, we get into the, the, the main kind of open area of this compound, this is where we're introduced to. Um, I believe this is where we're introduced to one of the Gru units there. Or maybe it's the next time that you meet them. I think it's when you return it's and Ocelot shows up. That's right. We'll, we'll get yeah. to that in a moment. Um, so you're ambushed anyway by a bunch of these soldiers who are looking for Sokolov, trying to stop them leaving. You take the soldiers out and you return back to the bridge that you crossed. And Sokolov is standing there and he looks up and he points and he says, there it is. And what I really loved about Metal Gear Solid three you you could kind of do it in the second one but it was more of an involuntary thing that you could do in the second one in the third one you had an option where if a cutscene was happening or one would appear in the corner and you can hold or one down on the, the the actual controller and look through snake's eyes so you could see what he sees so when sokolov says there it is or one immediately pops up and snake's yeah. focus will 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 look up at what's going on and it looks like this huge I think that's what Shagahod means, this trem- trembling behemoth or something like that. It's this monstrous tank just getting ready to fire off something. And it turns out that Sokolov was the man responsible for the creation of the Shagahod. Um, so Sokolov tells us as the player, phase one is already completed. They're just about to go into phase two and this is what they need me for. This is why I need to get out of here. This thing cannot be operational. It cannot go to get to the stage of being operational because it means it can launch nuclear weapons from any type of terrain, be it forest, mountains, urban, industrial, it does not matter. No matter what this thing fires off, the missiles will hit its target. It's that advanced kind of weaponry. And kind of going back to what Metal Gear Solid 1 and Metal Gear Solid 2 were kind of focused on in the timeline of this long franchise, it was much more futuristic, right? So if you look at Metal Gear Solid 1 with the Cyborg Ninja, it's like, whoa, what's going on here? Like this is Blade Runner kind of technology going on here. But in the 1960s, when this was going on, you are immediately introduced to this is a real threat. Like, I need to get the guy who created this out of here and back to the United States. So this does not happen because if he's gone, phase two can't be completed. And I think, sorry, before you go on, I think certainly, that, uh, certainly that's, that's accentuated more by, as you said, the fact that in Metal Gear Solid, Metal Gear Solid 2, you could find kind of fairly high-tech equipment as the games progressed. But here at the beginning of Snake Eater, you have a knife and a pistol to your name. Like, in the jungle. It's, you are hopelessly unequipped for what lies ahead. Mm -hmm. And that is true for most of the game. A lot of the gear Snake picks up isn't particularly advanced or high-tech. Even But the enemies have, you know, later on, they have like the hover car thing, yeah. Um, another bit, little, little bit, but it's still much more grounded than the first two games. Yeah. I think the most high powered piece of technology that Snake can come by are, I think they're like night vision goggles. And yeah, that, that, that's thermal a, goggles, yeah. Yeah, that's the sign at the times. Like the most high powered thing that this operative has are goggles. Whereas in the other titles, um, they're much more like, like they're much more advanced with the Stinger missile, the Nikita uh, guided rocket launcher and things like that. Yeah. Um, even the, the the radar itself, your soliton radar. Yeah, that was, um, that was that was that was technology that was so high powered even for the time. And even like looking back on it now, it's like it's a soliton radar. Like, what's the big deal? But like for the time that this that this particular title was centered about, this was like the next big thing. Yeah. I was like, oh crap! <laughs> I, I ain't know. ready. We're not ready. But we come to this bridge, and we've already crossed this bridge, and. I must say, <laughs> going back to play the game, even now, it's hard to even describe the relationship between Snake and the boss, because as the player, we're only told about the impact that the boss had on Snake. They're not even friends, but they're more than lovers. 
That's how they describe it, yeah. You know? Yeah. They're at that level of just perfect simpatico. And this one scene where you're crossing this bridge with Sokolov and Snake kind of turns around and, and, and sees the boss walking towards him. And I must say, the voice acting in this part, I have to truly commend David Hayter and Laurie Allen for this, this little performance. Many, many other performances happen between these two characters, but this is kind of like the first big, oh shit. In her hands, as she's walking, she has two briefcases and she drops one briefcase or suitcase or long hard case, whatever it is. And the bridge rocks to one side. She yeah. drops the other one and the bridge rocks to the other. And metaphorically, it kind of shows like the weight of the situation going on that both of these people's worlds are just being rocked back and forth, back yeah. and forth. They're She's the unbalancing snake. You know, it's like oh. they're the only two centerfolds in this situation. Yeah. Now, as I mentioned at the start of the video, as we were going into Selena Yarsk, you can talk to the boss and she will say that a soldier's duty is to their country, that they're killing machines to, to, to complete a mission. But after you pick up Sokolov, doesn't she go radio silent? She goes radio silent. Oh, so that that should tip you off. I was like, wait, where is the boss? But Why as a, as, responding? But as a first time player, you wouldn't even notice it. No, you just think, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, but when she when she comes forward and Snake says, boss, and she says, the, the, the boss responds, I'm defecting to the Soviet Union. And a chopper overhead pulls up and it, it, it's surrounded by hornets and this shadowy figure comes down and almost kind of upside down repels down and, and grabs Sokolov back up to the chopper and Snake is like what is what are you doing here like we're not, you're not supposed to be here and she says I'm defecting to the Soviet Union and as as the camera pans up to where the um to where the uh the, the, the chopper is this is where we're kind of introduced to who would be <clears throat> the mini bosses of the game, um, who are part of an elite unit called the Cobra unit, um, who all have their different kind of idiosyncratic behaviors. Yeah. The, with the Hornets, he's called the Pain. The guy who kind of trickled down like a spider to grab Sokolov, he's called the Fear. There's an older man there who must be at least 109. His name is the End. So this is like a, a, a an elite unit here, but in, in the in the moments that this is happening where we are powerless to stop Sokolov being taken back by Russia this is where we're introduced to the main the, the game's main antagonist he is a man by the name of Bereznikov Volgan and he's the main big bad of this game and how he enters the scene that there's rain starting to pour all so all, all, immediately like it just sets the tone that over a bridge, over a ravine, with this misty rain coming down, you're blind. The player is blind as to what's going on. And the Colonel Volgan takes the two uh, briefcases or, or long hard cases that, that the boss had brought with her. And we're not sure what's in these yet. Um, but Colonel Volgan basically says, deal with him, or, or I'll deal with him. And the boss says, no, he's, he's, he's my pupil, I'll deal with him. And Snake is kind of, he, he looks to her and he's like, what are, you, what are you doing? And as he goes to move out of the way, she strikes him, but she breaks his arm. Ooh. And it's the look of shock, of agony, of betrayal on Snake's face. This is, the, the graphical fidelity at the time was brilliant because not only do you see flashes of actual physical pain, you see internal pain coming out. And as his arm is broken and he's bent down on one knee, she says to him, go home, Jack. That's very important. Just go home, Jack. And as he's trying to get up, she extends her hand out to him. And Snake reaches up because he has such respect for her. And as she pulls him up, she elbows him and cracks two of his ribs and tosses him over the bridge. But as he's falling, Snake grabs her headband. And this is where the whole headband thing came in. Yeah. But to end that scene, I know you go into a moment where um, 
you have to uh, get on the radio to paramedic and she teaches you how to heal your arm and this and this and this. So that introduces the healing mechanic to the whole thing. The last cutscene that happens is when Colonel Vogan opens up those two briefcases and they are United States owned nuclear weapons. And he sets fire and blows up the compound that you're in with um, Sokolov. And that's kind of like end of chapter one. It kind of reminds me of the tanker chapter in Metal Gear Solid 2. This is like the intro of the game. And then the plant yeah. chapter happens with Raiden. But this is now we had the Virtuous Mission, which is the intro. And now we have Operation Snake Eater. And how this whole thing came around was, um, I think it was Khrushchev had contacted uh, the, the United States president and said, yeah, so um, we just found that one of your warheads went off in our compound, behind our compound. What were you doing there? Because they had also seen a, an airplane overhead, which yeah. is where Major Tom, Sigand, and Paramedic are. So now we are given a new objective, which is we have to stop the Shagahod, we have to rescue Sokolov again. It's like the Princess Peach of Metal Gear Solid. <laughs> but we also have to take down the boss. Your, your, your mentor, because she's defected. And this is yeah. all to stop World War III from happening. When you were playing the game, did you find um, a big kind of directional change in terms of the the territory that you're in with the characters that you that you were interacting with from the previous games? What was your, you know, what was your first impression of this new part in Metal Gear Solid 3? Or you can even talk about the Virtuous Mission if you want. I just want to well, get your opinion on it. I think, as I was kind of explaining earlier, the, the game, more so than the previous games, kind of opened things up a bit. Now, it was still a linear story, a linear adventure. Um, but more so than MGS1 and Sons of Liberty, you were given these sandboxes to play in. Small, on a small enough scale, it, it wasn't like fucking Ubisoft open world, any of that kind of thing. But it was... You know, I, I remember distinctly very, very early on after you begin the Snake Eater mission. You know, the virtuous mission is happening as a failure. Um, but shortly after you begin the next mission, you come up to kind of crossroads almost. So you walk into this area and you can walk straight ahead. Yes. Or you can turn to the right and yeah. loop around the area. Now there's guards straight ahead, there's guards to the right. There's trees you can climb up, there's tree trunks you can crawl through, high grass. Um, and you're just, it's basically like your little, your little sandbox to play. And you're like, okay, how are you going to get past these guys? Do you want to be a killer? And that's important as well, because that plays into the story in a really interesting way later on. Um, or do you want to knock them out or CQC or sneak past? Now, the thing is that is at this stage of the game, you have, again, little equipment. You don't have much to your name. So taking out enemies is a way to gather resources. So it's kind of worthwhile. But you're also putting yourself at risk because you are under-equipped compared to these. Like, they all have like AK-47s and you have your dinky little pistol and knife. Mm -hmm. So... That kind of direction that, that the game gives you is it, it, it's minimal direction. It's basically we're going to point you in a straight line, but on that straight line, you'll have a number of occasions to approach how you see fit. Yeah, and it's not like a lot of recent modern releases where in the advertising they're kind of like, oh man, look at this! Like you can take this one path or this other path or this third path. So much choice. No, it's just like no, here you go. Mm -hmm. You know how to play the game figure out what you want to do yeah and i love that i think i love when the it gives you the tools without holding your hand it, it, it respects the player yeah and the player's time yeah because a lot of the tutorial stuff is optional you can mm. ask for help if you want you can call major zero and listen to him shite on about bond films till the cows come home or... Wasn't it though? Sorry, just, just to cut across there though, did you, <laughs> did you not find that this was like a love letter from Kojima to James Bond? Especially oh, without a doubt. Here. Yeah. Snake. I'm still in a dream. And even the, the bit on the ladder, which we'll get to later. Oh, yes. Oh, bro, be Irish. Irish. Um, I love that section, man. I love that section. Great. It's, it's, it's great. And yeah, you're right. It is. It's one big love letter to Bond and a whole kind of spy 
espionage action thriller franchise like, genre because Snake, you know, he's constantly getting new gadgets and Major Zero in particular, he's like, oh, we could get you this or we could get you that. And paramedics all, oh, great. Now he's talking about Bond. He's not going to shut up for hours. He's like, I love it. And wasn't one of the one of the weapons that you can use is uh, it's sleeping gas in a cigar. Yeah, yeah. It's very it's very James Bond. It really is. Yeah. It really is. You can is. get a chloroform cloth as well, can you, for the CQC? I think so. Yeah, it's at the. It's, like it's, that. it's it's something you can find in one of the uh, in one of the science laboratories, I believe. That it's was it. Yeah. The prototype they were making, I believe. Um. So. The second half of the story officially takes place on August thirtieth, nineteen sixty-four, which is ironically Hideo Kojima's uh, birthday. Oh, he knew what he was doing. Exactly. Um. So we now have our mission. We have to go in and rescue Sokolov, destroy the Shagohod, kill the boss. That's the story, that that's the mission that the player is given. So sure. we land back in uh, this, uh, more or less the same kind of area of, Sil- of Selinoyarsk where we started. And we have to go back to where we met Sokolov in the beginning because we are now told that there are two CIA operatives who can get us in to the, to the, uh, the main stronghold of where um, the bad guys are being held. One of them is called Eva, E-V-A, and the other is called Adam, A-D-A-M. Um, Adam never really shows up in the beginning. He just does not appear. It's Eva who appears. And uh, the the code word that uh, Snake has to shout at the operative to make sure that they're not with the enemy is who are the Patriots. And that's the code. that like, And the response is la le lu le lo, which is, I found that quite interesting how this is how it all kind of started. And we will touch on this later on in the um, in the actual overall retrospective of, of Metal Gear Solid, which we will touch on later on. Um, but essentially, Eva is saying that, look, I'm the operative that you're supposed to meet. She's working as a sleeper agent. She's already infiltrated Colonel Volgan's ranks as a double agent called Tatiana. She wears kind of like a army kind of um, blazer. She's all dolled up and all that kind of thing. It's her purpose is to get close to Volgan to um it's kind of sabotage his mission his main objective which we will get to later on in the video um but i suppose uh moving on from when we meet eva this is where we are introduced to a character who i kind of got mixed up there at the beginning so my sincerest apologies for that um i haven't played this game in a while so it's easy to get things muddled up um but the night that snake meets eva the following morning they are ambushed by a uh, a gru unit gru unit and the leader of this unit is a young major with the code name Ocelot. <laughs> I never understood that, how he called his, his other soldiers by meowing, but maybe that was just, you know. It's just um, Kojima being Kojima. It's Kojima think, being you Kojima. Know, he's like, like, well, with, like with the boss being central to the story, Ocelot has an awful lot more to offer and he, he has an awful lot more going on in later years were you surprised to see ocelot appearing in metal gear solid 3 yeah i think it was interesting because the ocelot i was familiar with uh, from mgs1 and 2 he was the, the, the gruff cowboy um and i distinctly remember in metal gear solid 2 you know he he had his in in those new graphics he had his like long coat with his like ammo belt and his revolvers, um, but kept talking about Russia, and that kind of confused me when I was when I was younger. God, I was way too young to be playing these games. Uh, you know, he mentions the motherland and everything in Sons of Liberty when he kills uh, Colonel Gerlukovich, I think it was. Yeah, Colonel Gerlukovich. Uh, yeah, Olga Gerlukovich's father. And then in MGS3, he shows up, and it kind of adds a bit more sense. And even then, like, he's supposed to be Russian, but he has this distinct American accent. But then again, it kind of plays off the earlier thing where you know Snake is speaking in Russian to um, Sokolov so chances are he's speaking Russian to Ocelot as well mm-hmm. but Ocelot in this game he's a bit more of a greenhorn yeah like he's a punching bag yeah he's, he, he's the the, the punchline for a lot of the jokes early on in the game like he's still an interesting complex character but more often than not he wants to do a thing and then is just made fun of or embarrassed in some way shape or form and that's like, man, that is not like the Ocelot I know. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 great to see him as a younger character because he's oh, he's green. He's he's still a rookie, and I think it's it's that moment where um, uh, Snake kind of admires how he's standing 
and he said the pistol that you're using is a Glock you'd be much more comfortable with a revolver and it plants the seeds then doesn't it because yeah in later Metal Gear games Ocelot worshipped this man he worshipped Big Boss and Ocelot is central to a lot of the, the conflict in the later games because of this yeah and his allegiance was always towards Big Boss in the later games no matter yeah. what happened you can see the, the the kind of burgeoning respect that he has for the bot for Big Boss or yeah. at the time maybe Snake you yeah. can see because Snake as you said he suggests like oh you'd be better with a revolver so he comes back with a revolver yeah. Snake is like, oh, well, what's with all the flashy designs in your revolver? They had no tactical advantage, so he just gets playing revolvers. Exactly. And it's like he, I think because Snake bested him early on, yeah. he's like, this guy's fucking good. Yeah. And he does say that. He says, you're pretty good. He's the one who says that to Ocelot in the beginning. He says, you're pretty good. And that's kind of... Pretty good. <laughs> and that's that's kind of like Ocelot's trademark then throughout the rest of the franchise. Yeah. Um, but it's going back on a point that you made there when um, Snake almost criticizes him when Ocelot then gets his revolver. Snake says, why are you only using one? That just limits you to, sh to six, six shots. shots. Yeah. And that's when he gets the dual revolvers. Brilliant. It's so character development is happening here. Yeah. And it's, 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 an, it's, um, it's one of those things as well that this version of Snake, Naked Snake, has a bit more agency, I think, than Solid Snake did in his stories. Um, Naked Snake has a more personal connection to the plot that's happening in front of him. I know, obviously, like Liquid Snake and Solid Snake in MBS is one and two are directly linked to Solid Snake in some way. Mm. But this story is a bit more personal mm -hmm. because it is it's someone Naked Snake cared about more than anyone else in the world has betrayed everything he thought he knew. Yeah. Um, do you know what's so also, do you know, Sorry to cut across you, though. Yeah. So. What's so patronizing about the moments like that when Snake and the boss meet up again? It's like she's speaking to him. It's like she's speaking to Snake like he's a bold child. Like, just go yeah. home. Like, dude, come on. <laughs> like, she still has that motherly kind of affection for him. Like, just go home. This is more than you can handle right now. But, like, and Snake's mission is I have to take her out. Yeah. You know, I I'm the one who has to take her out. Nobody else will. But it's that whenever he meets the boss and it, it when I first when I first played the game I was like I have to kill this person but because that's what the game is telling me the game is telling me this is what you have to do you're conditioned as a player to do that but as the story went on I was like am I am I doing the right thing because these two characters worship each other so what's right and wrong here you know it's it also it, humiliate snake a number of times like the the first time they meet after she breaks his arm is at his downed vessel that he arrived in and she yes. destroys this she stomps on his hand with a horse yeah like she she disassembles his gun before he yeah. can even react so more often than not she's it, it's always non-lethal because she still cares for snake and ultimately i think she knows she has to prepare him to take her out yeah and that's heartbreaking it's like so often she beats him down to make him come back at her better yeah and that's why i think it, as well yeah it, it's something the game does really well because you encounter the boss so many times through the story and never in gameplay but in the story itself you don't actually i think fight her until the actual finale you're right and it's something again like metal gear solid and metal gear solid 2 did very well i love the villains in those games but like snake doesn't really encounter liquid snake solid snake doesn't encounter liquid snake much in mgs1 uh raiden doesn't encounter solid snake much early on in the game mm -hmm. you know the main antagonists of those games they're still there there's still a presence yeah but there's less of a personal connection and less of a recurrence for the villain whereas mm -hmm. big boss i'm sorry boss and volgan regularly show up to pound on naked snake but isn't it amazing though? Like at the at this at the, the the very start of the game, you can contact her and and learn a little bit more about her, get more information about how to handle a situation. Like it's from from straight away, like she's she's by your side and she doesn't leave your side right until the the end of the game. Um, so I have to admit to you though, Shepard, those Cobra unit, that, that Cobra unit, right? Th those members of the Cobra unit. They were fucking abysmal. 
they were yeah. the worst boss fights I've ever played in the Metal Gear Solid game because they were so stereotypical, right? I, I think the only one who redeemed himself was the end, that, that long sniper sequence where it happens in the center part of the story. But I just, it, there wasn't, it wasn't like in Metal Gear Solid 1 where, where you were hunting down the Fox unit. These are the guys. Yeah. You know, it, it just, it didn't click with me for some reason. Like, like it, they just came across as goofy or kind of more Hollywoodized kind of villains. They, they didn't have, you know. They weren't as deep. Um, a, big, a big thing for like Foxhound, you know, um, Raven, for example. Oh, yeah. Uh, he had his reasons for doing what he was doing. Like, he told you his, like, I know a big thing with the Metal Gear Solid games is the exposition dump from the, from the mini bosses before the fight or after the fight, depending and like you know sniper wolf like th these characters in mgs1 the foxhound unit did have stories and they had connections to other characters in some way shape or form and then they talked to you solid snake about their stories in metal gear solid 2 dead cell have a really great presence particularly vamp and fortune you yeah. know um and completely understand their motivations like they you actually the and the beasts uh unit from metal gear yeah. solid 4. actually i'll actually <laughs> The Beauty and the Beast for me are the Cobra unit for you, if you get me. I was just like, for me, the, the Beauty and the Beast core was so, yeah, we did this in the last few games. I suppose we'll do it here. And they're modeled after previous boss fights in some way. And then Drebin yeah. just calls and is like, here's their backstory after you've killed them. So for mm -hmm. me, it was a bit weaker in four. But like Dead, I think Dead Cell was probably the peak for me because okay. Vamp and Fortune, they weren't just separate characters. They were... A team a unit. of people. Yeah, like Fortune and Vamp had that relationship with each other. Fat Man had like, you know, his his whole history with the bomb disposal expert. Stillman, yeah. Stillman, yeah. And there's, you know, so there's these little stories woven into the narrative of Sons of Liberty that wasn't really there in Snake either. Like the, the Cobra unit apparently had some personal connection to the boss, but you don't really see that except for the sorrow. Yeah. The, because from... she's the joy, he's the sorrow. Even the sorrow appears hidden you know in those r1 moments you mentioned earlier uh he's kind of hiding around in the background and can also influence events in the game in some way like when you find out the the code for the cell you wind up being later on or you can watch the timer countdown for the bombs later on but he he's the only one with any visible connection to the boss they don't really explain the rest of them the yeah. pain is just I'm the pain hornets and shit um the fear while i don't like the fierce character i don't mind his boss fight too much because it plays on the whole the multiple heat. approaches thing um you know like so you can throw poisonous food for him to eat and he'll get sick and then you have a chance to attack or you can lay traps and that kind of thing the fury was the worst the fury was terrible i hate the fury yeah i'm kind of at a loss with those guys to be honest with you um it, Fair. like it just <sighs> For me, the two the two sequences that I really enjoyed with the Cobra unit themselves as yeah. boss fights, because you kind of have to think outside the box a little bit, was the end and the sorrow. And like what you mentioned there, like you can actually see the sorrow right at the beginning of the game. It's when the boss chucks you over the bridge. Yeah. And when you go- That's where the fog comes from, the, the rain and everything. Yeah, because that's his thing. He brings the, 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 the bad weather and things like that. But like when you're healing yourself, if you press R1 and look to the left, you can see the skeletal remains. Yeah. Um with with the with the end, there's there's multiple different ways of actually doing that boss battle. Um there's a cutscene where uh you can actually snipe him after a cutscene and his wheelchair. Oh yeah, before the encounter. Yeah, yeah, and then but where the the end should have been is just a Gru unit. And Major Tom comes on and says, um, oh, it looks like you got rid of the end. Like, you, you won't have to deal with him. And Snake is like, uh, yeah, I suppose so. And uh, Tom is like, Major Tom is like, don't tell me you thought you could put your skills up to the legendary sniper, which is the end. Ah. You know, but when it came to the sorrow, then you have to use the um, revival pill. Which you may have not used up to this point. So you, you may, may not, not even know that. that you had it, though. Yeah. So those two uh, encounters, you kind of have to think outside the box a little bit. Another way that you can kill the kill the end is by fast forwarding the internal clock on your console, yeah. so he dies of old age. It's brilliant, brilliant. brilliant. You so, can even sneak up on him, yeah, and hold him up, yeah, and, and get his sniper rifle. Yeah, it's like there's so many. It's it, it's one of those things where like sniper battles are, you know, they've been in Metal Gear 
since the beginning, as far as I'm aware. You know, like you had the battle, you had two battles with Sniper Wolf and MBS One. You had uh, sniper battles in MBS Two, where you're protecting Bam. Emma, that kind of thing. And then in MGS3, it's like, right, let's do a sniper v sniper proper. Let's but it have was this huge. Yes, yeah, three enormous locations. And you could be really clever about it because it involves tracking and hunting. And if you have found the thermal goggles, you can find his footprints in the, in the ground and follow yeah. them. Yeah. Um, but he can do the same to you. He's tracking you all the time. You nearly, sometimes you might bait a shot from him because then he'll show up briefly on your map. Oh, this is where the shot came from. Yeah. And you can you can catch him running away. It's so amazing Organic. when you thought it like the, the, the fight could last ages, or you can finish it in minutes. It's incredible. It's down to player choice, though, isn't it? Which again yeah. is the theme of the narrative: choice and consequence. Brilliant. Love that shit. Um, just going back on what you said there about um, about the end. There's there's a part in this in, in the in the central part of the game. You are on your way to find where. Uh, Sokolov is, and um, Eva is the one who gives you her radio frequency, but she she can only kind of kind of appear at brief moments of the game because she's technically by Volgan's side at all time. Now yeah. it turns out he was like brutally abusing her. Yeah. There's a there's a cutscene when she's she's getting dressed into her biker gear, and as she's getting out of her uniform, you can see scars and bruising. Like Volgan for me. He was kind of one-dimensional in the sense of he's just a sadist. Yeah. You look at it pure and simple. Like you look at Liquid Snake, you look at Solid Snake, you know, you look at Liquid Ocelot. They all had different agendas that they were working towards. And in some yeah. ways you can be kind of sympathetic towards them. But, yeah. But Volgan was just the kind of James Bond villain. There needs to be a money. villain. So yeah, he was exactly. like, I want the philosopher's legacy. Shit ton of money. Thanks. And we will get to the philosopher's legacy now in just a moment. And um, so there's there's a part in the center part of the story when you're hunting down uh, Sokolov and you get to this uh, research bureau and you are told that there's a man there by the name of uh, uh, Granin. Um, he's an older gentleman and you have to wear the scientist suit to get a key code to... I, I didn't understand actually how Snake can walk around with a bandana and glasses and stuff. I was about to say, it's, yeah. it's a little telling. That he may not fit in. Yeah. And the way he walks, he kind of hunched over. It was a bit strange. Because yeah. I I used to wear the Rydanovich mask. Oh. Oh and yes. Even, and even then that put people on high alert. And I was like, but I'm wearing a mask. Like, would you I'd rather wear a mask than walk around with a bandana? Something is kind of telling here. But um, you meet um Granin, and he says that uh he he's kind of like a, a rival of Sokolov. They don't really agree on a lot of things even though they're both engineers for the same kind of thing and this is yeah. our first hint um in the conversation that we have with granon and he says what was the missing link between primates and humans and snake is kind of like look dude all i need is information on how to get to where sokolov is being held i don't need any more philosophical musings right now and then he says but what's the difference between infantry and artillery and Snake is like, and Granon is like, legs. And he shows Snake the blueprint. And he says, this type of gear, this metal gear, so to speak, will be the link between infantry and artillery. And that is the first time in the entire series that we hear the name metal gear. But isn't it interesting that in the background, if you do the whole or one thing, you can see yeah. a picture of Granon beside Otacon's dad. Or his grandfather, it must have been. It was yeah. his grandfather. Um... So it's nice to have little tidbits here and there kind of sprinkled in and um, little subtle callbacks that you may not have noticed. I really enjoy little things like that in, in games, especially with Hideo Kojima. They're kind of sprinkled all over the place if you pay attention. Um, oh, very um, but we leave Granin's, um, we leave his, his uh, the science laboratory. We have our run in with the end. And I think, isn't this the part where you meet up with Eva? And she says that there is a fortress called Groznagrad, and that is where the Shagahod is being held. That is where Sokolov is. And for a game that had been built around the jungle aesthetic, the stealth mechanics, the flora and fauna, how you catch animals, how you can use their hides for poisonous darts, how you can use them as bait to trick the enemy, how you can even uh, wait until the meat's expired and poison the enemy and things like that. 
In a lot of the other Metal Gear games, the more industrial structures were introduced rather quickly into the whole game itself. You take Shadow Moses, for example, when you come up from the helipad or from the docks up onto the yes. helipad, and you, you see the actual building itself. As Raiden, when you're swimming in through the hole in the fence and you come into the into the shell construct when you exit the elevator. For Metal Gear Solid 3 to introduce that actual industrial setting, that very grimy look, I really like that because it's removing you from primitive nature to more man-made nature. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's um it's very well done because obviously throughout the game there are sprinkled buildings and you know cabins or like dormitories or barracks or that kind of thing. Um and it, you know the the science compound you go through at one point early on that you mentioned before. Um and it's uh when you climb the mountain you know, so you, you start to leave the jungle behind you. It's like a gradual transition. So it's still it's still nature, but you're not surrounded by trees and flora and fauna. Uh, there's less wildlife, more kind of snakes and birds than snakes and spiders. <laughs> uh, and then you know you go to the little um, the look out there up on the, on the mountain. Yeah. Yeah, and then that's that's where you um, you meet Eva and you look down over the the facility. Yeah. And I think from there you also find. That's where you witness Granon. Is it Granon's death? It's Granon, yeah. So Volgan, so the, the, the problem at this point of the story is Volgan is now being very suspicious that there might be a spy. Yeah. And Ocelot is, he's also a member of Volgan's kind of group. And he is, Ocelot is the one who is constantly pointing the finger at Tatiana, who is Eva, and being like, you're the spy. Because in a previous uh, run-in with Ocelot, I think it's the second time you go to the compound where Sokolov was, he has her by gunpoint and can smell the perfume that she's wearing. Yeah. And immediately says, this bitch is wearing perfume. But it's the same perfume that Tatiana is wearing. Eva and Tatiana are the same person. So Volgan is then saying to the boss, how is it that one man knows where the Cobra unit is? How is it that one man can take down these legendary soldiers? Somebody is helping him out. So there's an internal conflict going on now within Volgan's little inner group. And it turns out that it is Eva who is playing both sides. Yeah. But Volgan is seen, uh, as you said, Shepard, you're looking down at this, it's almost through your binoculars, I believe it is. And you yeah. see Volgan sparring against a uh, an oil drum and bolts of electricity are going off because that's his thing. He can yeah. punch electricity. He can do that. <laughs> Leave him to it. And um, as the sparring is, is continuing on, you can actually see blood leaking out from the bottom of the barrel and it's it's Granon and Granon was obviously working for Volgan but Volgan is convinced that Granon was the guy who was leaking the information um, so Eva is the one who says to you look there's a way to get into the innermost sanctum part of Groznegrad and you'll need to steal the clothes of Colonel Rydenovich Rykov who was modelled after I think it was a, a bit of a middle finger towards Raiden in Metal Gear Solid 2 because it's the same kind of character yeah. model. Um, you can even get, depending on an option you pick at the start of the game. I liked Metal Gear Solid 1. I liked Metal Gear Solid 2. I liked I've Metal never Gear played Solid 2. Yeah. 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 Um, if you pick, I liked Metal Gear Solid 2, the reveal of Snake, he pulls his... his uh, he pulls the mask off. mask or whatever, kind of a oxygen mask off to be riding and everyone anyone who picked i liked mbs2 was probably like Wait, what the fuck yeah what <laughs> yeah yeah that's confusing but you um you you then have a confrontation with uh rykov and you take his uniform and as you're putting him into the locker the <laughs> the actual the, there's a poster on the door that has riding from metal gear solid 2 sons of liberty and um, it was very tongue-in-cheek i must say oh yeah yeah, so you disguise yourself as Rykov, you go in to find where Sokolov is, and this is where we see the exchange of hands between Sokolov and Eva, or Tatiana, we'll just say, and it's the exchange of the Philosopher's Legacy. Now, you had brought up the Philosopher's Legacy at the start of the video. Um, would you like to elaborate on, on what that was? It is, if I recall correctly, because it has been a little while since I've touched the game as well, and I think that's something we should clarify we do these videos from memory a lot of the time because or we do some research prior to the event but it's 
it's more about the emotional connection to the story and yeah. the characters and the, the whole thing. Um, if I recall correctly, the Philosopher's Legacy was essentially the superpowers. You're right. Gathered their resources yeah. together. Yeah. Into right. one, like a trust fund. Exactly. Uh, squirreled away yeah. ridiculous amount of money for the time. Yeah. Um, and that's what Volgan wants. He wants all of that money because yeah. he couldn't think of an easy way to get it with a nuclear missile, apparently. Well, well, we'll see. Um, Volgan was actually uh, an inheritor of the Philosopher's Legacy. and That was it. Yeah, so... Um, there, there's kind of like another subplot going on there where they're trying to take the legacy away from Volgan um, yeah. because he wants to repower Russia up as being the, the primitive... Uh, sorry, the alpha superpower, which again goes back to the point that we made. It was a this whole story starts off with the three main superpowers colliding together and who is who is bigger power and this and this anyway um you you witness sokolov handing eva the philosopher's legacy he managed to squirrel it away from volgan now the actual the, the actual amount of money on this particular uh type of microchip i believe it's like a hundred billion dollars or something like that it was when the three main powers of world war ii put their trust fund together and it was the United States, Russia, and China, and it's all on this one disc. So whoever has this one disc is basically God. Uh, they've got indispensable income, essentially, for the time that, that this story was. Um, Volgan comes in and sees you disguised as Rykov talking to Sokolov, um, and this is where... It... it gets a bit dark. For use of a better word, yeah. Um, there's very few moments in gaming that shock me. I think I'm a little bit conditioned, like yourself. Um, mm. where, We've been but, doing this a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's when Volgan realizes that you are not Ivan, who he calls Ivan, because they are also secret lovers. And Volgan knows Ivan Rydanovich Rykov better than anyone else. And he rips the mask off and finds out that there's our, there's our guy. He's been the one causing us this trouble. And uh, Eva is still in the uh, is still in the room at this moment, I think. And Sokolov essentially gets his kneecap shot out, and he bleeds out. And Volgan, he absolutely mangalizes Snake. He just does not give up. And yeah, it was that moment when I was watching that. It's a it's a it's a cutscene when it happens, but when you can almost hear the impact of the punches. The crack of skin, the breaking of someone's tooth—it's—it's it's very visceral. Even um, for the time as well, it was quite impressive, like graphically, because you could see the physical toll appearing on Snake's face. You know, like the bruises, the blood. There's a couple of punches where you see like blood splatter out in kind of an arc, which you normally wouldn't see at the time. It was more like generic kind of blobby blood effects would come out, like like any other wound in the game. But these were carefully curated. They went the extra mile to make this beating as visceral as possible for 2005. Absolutely. And it's only the beginning of Snake's suffering. Yes. So while you're watching this going on, and like what you said, you can actually see scarring appear on Snake's face, bruising just this visceral, he's being punished. And Volgan is reveling in this because he's a sadist. But it's like, yeah. you hurt somebody that I loved, I will fucking take you out. And the next scene is when you're in this um, this other cell and there's blood smeared on the walls and Snake is kind of hanged up by his wrist and there's a bag over his head and Ocelot, the boss, Volgan and Eva are in the same room and uh, they're wondering who the spy is and Ocelot is continuously pointing at Eva and being like, you're the spy. How else could he have known about this? But the boss steps in very subtly and says, you don't know what you're talking about. She can't be the spy. And then Volgan turns to the boss and says, I mean this with the greatest of respects, but could you please prove to me that you're not the spy? Because the boss is like the mother of special forces combat. Like this is the person that everything is based around. Yeah. And the boss says, um, what can I do to, to make you believe that I'm, I'm not the person that you think I am? And Volgan looks across and says, cut out his eyes I don't like those blue eyes of his a soldier's most deadly weapon are his eyes prove it to me cut his eyes out 
He's your he's your pupil. End him. End him. And it's that moment when the boss rips the the ballot the the kind of the paper bag or the balaclava off of the snake's head, and you can actually see snake's lip quivering. Yeah. He's, he, like he's afraid at this point. It's like, don't do it, please, don't do it, don't do it, please, don't do it. But it's like as the boss gets closer with the knife, she turns to Volgan and says, "What good is this going to prove?" But then the camera transitions over to Ocelot. And he says, I'm going to prove it to you who the traitor is. It's that bitch over there. And he points at Tatiana and he takes out the two revolvers and he empties the, the, the actual chamber, but keeps one bullet in there. And he starts juggling. He starts juggling the revolvers towards her and pulls the trigger on each one. Each second rotation that comes down, he pulls the trigger. But Snake can see which gun has the bullet loaded in. And to save Eva, he pushes himself towards Ocelot, and as he fires, the gunshot tears his right eye away. But isn't it brilliant then that as he's swinging about the place, Snake, and crying in agony as blood is pumping out of this open wound, the boss says, that's it, it's done, it's sorted. Get out of here. He, she says to uh, Ocelot, Tatiana, Eva, and Volgan. But she goes up to Snake and says, run, and gives him one bullet with the single action army uh, revolver, puts it into his inventory and says, go, get out, just leave this to me, get out of here. And it's immediate like, shit, is she still on my side? How do I go about playing this? You escape Grozny Grad. Before uh, you do actually, don't forget. Um, Cell. Uh, Ocelot. Ocelot, yeah, okay. Do you remember uh, when you're hanging from the, the thing, Ocelot jabs you in the back? Yes, um, the and, transmitter. Yeah. Transmitter in your shoulder. Yeah. Um, so he places a transmitter on you so he can keep keep tabs about what you're doing. That's a very good point. I completely missed about that. I forgot that even happened. It's again, it's a it's a minor little detail, uh, but it works into the survival menu later on, you know, the healing menu, because you can you have to remove it with yourself with the knife. Yeah. Yeah. Great little detail. And also going back to when you're in that cell, I think every Metal Gear game has a cell sequence. Um so with Metal Gear Solid uh, 3, you had that, that part after the, the torture, the torture part. With Metal Gear Solid 1, you had when you're in the, the room with the DARPA chief and you have to get out of there. With Metal Gear Solid 2, um, you're, you're locked up in the, in the room in Arsenal Gear. <clears throat> um, I don't think Metal Gear Solid 4 had one. No, I don't think 4 did. No, but it's, it's actually a cute kind of scene in, in, the, in the cell in Groznygrad where you meet Johnny's great... Yeah. You meet Johnny's grandfather. But you escape Groznygrad anyway, and... Um, you're being hunted by Ocelot and a few of the Gru members and the only way out of Grozny Grad is through the sewers and it's a gorgeous beautiful cutscene where kind of Snake out outstends his arms and he dives backwards into the ravine and this is where you have your boss encounter with the Sorrow and I think it's worth it's kind of worth noting that the Sorrow and the boss was Ocelot's parents yeah i actually they, didn't know that they were they were ocelot's parents that I'll, I'll i'll come back to that point later uh towards the end of the video um but I, i'll make it i'll make it known yeah so that's the reason why ocelot is a bit more spiritual because of the sorrow oh, well, yeah shit. there you go um so coming to the end of metal gear solid 3 you uh you essentially have your your encounter with the shagohod with volgan um you have the sorrow kind of following you around you can look through the, the the first person view with R1 and it's it's kind of funny and very clever that like part of your view is kind of closed off because of the yeah. eye patch on your eye. Yeah, you ain't got an eyeball. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you have your last encounter with Volgan and the Shagohod. Uh, you defeat Volgan um, and the Shagohod with uh, Eva and him are kind of, sorry, Eva and Snake are kind of on a bike exiting Groznagrad. It's a rock concert. It's a brilliant, it's actually, it's, it's so fluidly done, it's brilliant. Um, and towards the end, you're escaping and Eva gets impaled by a, uh, a tree branch uh, after you, both you and her take a, a tumble and um, you have to do an escort mission to get her back to the chopper. You've radioed in Zero to let her know, to let him know that like, this is where we are, we need to get out of here right now. Um, which is, it's fine. Like that sequence, it's fine. It wasn't the worst escort part I've ever played, but like still. It was brief. 
You know, yeah, it was great. mercifully short. Um, Eva, like generally, I think a lot of it you can kind of keep ahead of the people chasing you. Yeah. So it's not too bad. Um, but after such a good scene on a good section on the motorbike, I feel like it kind of jams, like it slows it down too much after that amazing section. And don't get me wrong, immediately yeah. after this is the incredible fight with the boss. Um, but that's, just, the point that, that's the point that I was going to make. Like, I think I would rather have had a little bit more of a breather in between yeah. those sections rather than going from high octane to fighting the boss. I would like to have a little bit more of a, of a breather section in between those moments because going from high octane action to a one-on-one -on -one sequence, you know, it's... You, you could have still done, say, that escort side of things, but maybe without any any enemies. Mm -hmm. So say you're you're you have to hold Eva's hand or whatever, kind of like you do with Emma in MDS two, and you're kind of you're bringing her all along, and then say her stamina as her stamina decreases and you gradually lose the ability to bring it back up. Like maybe she starts to stumble, and you have to pick her up and carry her more, something like that. Maybe I I feel like because you work it into the gameplay, then how much pain she's in how much danger she's in and do you let some of your equipment go so you have more strength to carry her yeah something like that, that. Great, like. yeah just to really play off you know this snake's connection to eva is cemented now you know they, they've bonded they've they've done the deed um didn't they do the deed in the waterfall um it's it's hinted at it's hinted at but i know yeah, it kind of cuts away she was removing the transmitter from Ocelot's wound. That as was it, a, yeah. Yeah, she was removing it. And it, the, the shadow play was a little bit very Kojima, to be honest with you. It, it was PS2 as well, you know, where, like, there were, I think I think she kisses him, but it's kind of more like rubbing two dolls against each other. So it's kind of... You see, Eva, for me, was, like, she has her own kind of agenda going on oh, here. Oh, definitely. Um, and we will get to this. We're coming to the end of Metal Gear Solid 3 now. We have yeah. skipped over a lot. But I think highlighting yeah. the main things that do happen and our our opinions towards them is what is what matters. Um, but she does have her own agenda going on. Um, but I think it's at the end of that 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 um, escort part of the game, and it did kind of slow things down. And I'm I'm a bit hit and miss on it, to be honest with you. Um, I would like to have seen something different, maybe. But yeah. That's just me. But. This really got me. This really got me. <laughs> At the end of the game, you're met with the boss. And it's this beautiful... Like, everything that has been leading up to this moment has been very gritty, has been very white knuckle. Like, it's been bloody, it's been gruesome. Snake has, the snake has been tortured. His eye was shot out. Um, there's a lot of really dark things going on. And you end up in this last area, and it's a moment of serene bliss in this area of white lilies decorating the place. And the boss, the boss appears in front of you, and I can't really remember every single word of dialogue that she says because it's a lot of exposition in this scene yeah where she says that um when she started the cobra unit and when she met her her lover which was the sorrow and she gave birth on the battlefield which is why when she opens up her power suit you, you can see the surgical scar of a snake going from the top of her rib cage down to her abdomen and um her baby was taken away from her much like olga Golukovic in Metal Gear yeah. Solid uh, 2, Sons of Liberty. Her, uh, Olga's baby was taken away by the Patriots. The boss's baby was taken away by the Philosophers. And both her and Snake know now, at this point, it can only go one way. But the boss is saying, are you loyal to me? Or are you loyal to your country? And as the player, you're like, well, why would I be loyal to the boss? Like, she's done nothing but break my arm and chuck me over a, a, a bridge and it's been nothing but a nuisance. But as experienced players who have, who have played the title more than once, you kind of realize, like, the boss has been kind of guiding you th throughout the whole... Th she's been by your side without you even knowing. Yeah. 
and the only other boss battle I can think of in the Metal Gear series where you have to put everything you're taught into this one part. The only other boss battle I can think of is, is uh, with Raven in the, the frozen part of the of the map when you have to yeah. use the rocket launchers and you have to be you have to be careful of where you are and things like that. With the boss, you have to put together everything you know from CQC to what weapons to use, to what camouflage and, and face paint you have to use. And you're on a timer because if you don't win this moment, if you don't, if you don't win this battle in 10 minutes, the entire place is going to be bombed. So already you're at a you're 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 being put on the clock. And it's that last scene when she's lying on her back after you've beaten her. And she's looking up at you and she hands you the Patriot, her gun. Yeah. And was it that she said there's only there's only room in this world for one snake? That was probably later on in the franchise, but I think she said something along the lines of that that, that same wording. There's only room for one boss. One boss. One boss. Yeah. And this is all while the song Life's End is playing. Yeah. And gorgeous piece, very melancholic, fitting the envi- you know with the environment, with the the voice acting, the whole thing. It just it comes together and kind of coalesces into this perfect moment. Um, and the game, fuck the fucking game, man! It it makes you pull the trigger. You're not getting out of this. Yeah, and as she's lying there looking up at you. She's basically saying, "You will, you'll live for me." Yeah. And you press square, and you hear that like this is the one gunshot that is so loud. It echoes, yeah. almost endlessly. It echoes, and as the gunshot goes off, the white flowers are dyed red. Yeah, in a ripple effect. In a ripple effect. And I think it's that moment when the innocence of Big Boss died and all that's left is the blood of the snake. Yeah. Big Boss. So the game ends officially. Um, you have an encounter with Ocelot on the um, on the chopper you're escaping. Or oh, the wig, as it's called, yeah. The wig, yeah. yeah and you have the, the revolver. Yeah. Spin your revolver and shoot. Yeah. And uh, he... He escapes and says, "You're pretty good." You know, he jumps out of the uh, out of the uh, the wig itself, and then we see uh, Eva and and Snake alone in a cabin, and they're having that last hurrah to themselves. And then whatever happens happens, and Snake wakes up and he he wakes up to a photo of the boss with a and he turns it around and there's a, a goodbye with a, a lipstick mark on it, whatever. And Eva goes into this beautiful monologue where she says that the boss had never betrayed her country. Um, that she was a true patriot. Yeah. That she didn't want World War III to happen and she gladly gave her life up for her country. And as this monologue is going on, you can see Snake in military gear walking towards the Oval Office where all his other comrades are waiting for him. You've got Major Zero, Sigand, uh, and Paramedic, and there's a few other politicians there. And um, it's like in this moment, like Big Boss knew her, or the boss knew herself that she was she was going to be a scapegoat. She would go down in history as a war criminal. And um, you know, it's that moment when Big Boss, or sorry, Snake is standing there, and and the president says, "I would now lo- like to award you the title of Big Boss," and holds his hand out. And Snake just stares at him for what appears to be an eternity. And finally, um, he shakes the, the president's hand. And um, he leaves. And he goes to where the boss was buried and lays down a wreath of those flowers that are similar to the battle arena um, where he fought the boss and gave the final salute. And from his his one working eye a tear runs down his face so here is a man who has been um, betrayed by his own country 
said that he was going to like your your mission objective is to go and kill the boss but the reason why you're going to kill her is because she defected the reason why she defected is because the united states told her to defect to present to, to prevent world war three and i think this is where everything kicks off at this point everything you know this is the blood of the snake but um coming into we've skipped across a lot of snake eater there's a lot to deal with in there and i think we've highlighted the main points and and things like that um i think it's important to to tell our viewers who are watching now at this point and thank you so much for sticking with us we're, we're dealing with a, a big a big entry at the moment um i personally haven't played portable ops um i'm not too sure if it's canon there's a discrepancy about that um but then 10 years later peace walker was released for the PSP, which takes place in 1973. Um, so 1973, which is then two months before the whole Ground Zero thing that did happen yeah. in Big Boss's story. Um, I think it's important to premise that, Shepard, you haven't played it. I've played it, but it didn't really make an impact on me personally. Yeah, <clears throat> I tried it on the HD collection when that came out years ago. And it, I found the control stiff. I know it was originally built for a handheld, so I can't really judge how it plays on a console, like a home console. It just didn't do anything for me at the time. Uh, I was also at a phase in my life where I was kind of snobby about like graphics and like because the, the cutscenes were motion comics, which nowadays I, I love when I see them. But at the time, I was kind of like, eh, it's not real cutscenes. Uh, so I was kind of put off by that. So I didn't play another Metal Gear game until Guns of the Patriots. And even then I couldn't get that at release because I didn't own a PS3 when it came out. So, yeah, no, I've, I've no experience with portal ops, portable ops. I've no experience with Peace Walker, really. Uh, I went to Guns of the Patriots and then I waited however many years until the next big boss game came out. Which was Grand Zeroes officially, wasn't it? Yeah, the 40, 40 euro demo. Yeah, this is, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've got a lot of problems with Ground Zeroes, to be honest with you. I mean, yeah. so I suppose I have played a little bit of Portable Ops, and I'll just give a brief kind of side note on what that is. Cool. Um, essentially, it's um, it's set, I think, two years after the, the, um, the ending of Metal Gear Solid 3. It's actually where you meet Roy Campbell as Big Boss, and he's a POW, and you have to get him out of there. Didn't That's play awesome. that much of it, um, but it is a, it, it's an interesting title in the sense that you meet Null, um, who's also known as Frank Yeager, which you will discuss this in, in the next video. Um, yeah. But with Peace Walker, it's set um, 10 years after the events of Metal Gear Solid 3. So are we calling him Big Boss or are we calling him Snake? I think he's, he's not Snake anymore, I don't think. I think he's Big Boss now. So that's that's another thing. So I was kind of confused about this because he he is given the title Big Boss, but he doesn't believe he's Big Boss. He's yeah. still really hurt about what happened to him. So there's a there's an opening sequence in Peace Walker where you are training on a beach in Colombia, and the the military out the, the, the military out, outfit that um Big Boss has created is called MSF, which is Militaire Sans Frontières which is a French description for soldiers without borders. It's kind of like the blueprint for outer heaven, which we will get to. Um, but even the, the soldiers that you're training will say, thank you so much, big boss. It's great to be here. And he'll say, just call me snake. And it's, it's, it's interesting to notice, to note that in this title, he actually permanently scarred in the snake um, incision mark that the boss had. Um, I'm going to be totally honest with you with peace Walker, I couldn't play it, and I'm probably going to be lynched for this in the comments, but I couldn't play it. Um, I didn't feel like for a game as immersive as Metal Gear, um, it needs to be on a, a proper controller on a bigger screen. And I know they were restricted with time constraints and, you know, technology at the time with the PSP, but it just didn't click with me. Um, I found the, the controls to be quite cumbersome. Um, but the, the, the story is basically that... Um, Snake and his um, his soldiers without borders um, are being sent to Costa Rica to liberate it from the CIA. So now the CIA who 
where our guys in Metal Gear Solid 3, they're our enemy. Um, and one of the um, one of the people who come to visit Snake uh, say that she was bird watching and she saw a giant spaceship across um, across Costa Rica. And she plays a recording. And in the recording, you can hear it's Jack, go home. And immediately you think that that's the boss, but how is she, how is she alive? We, we saw her die at the end of Metal Gear Solid 3. Um, it turns out that there was a doctor by the name of Dr. Strangelove who had gained documents from the CIA about the boss and she was looking to replicate the boss's will, essentially. Um, it's, it's a bit convoluted, um, to be honest with you, because it doesn't really mention that much about Major Zero or the organization that he went on to um, in this timeline. Um, but essentially with, with Peace Walker, it's, it's Solid Snake and Kazuhiro Miller, who is a center part of the Ground Zeroes and Phantom Pain um, story. This is where they start developing their own military, where they have nuclear weapons, they have their own prototype of Metal Gear and things like that. Um, so I, I can't really talk about it because I didn't really play it that much. It just didn't really stick with me, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, so kind of closing off this video now, and once again, everybody, thank you so much for joining us on this brand new edition of the Save Point. Um, Shepard, it's great to have you here. Um, do you remember what happened with Ground Zeroes? Briefly, it's um, it crammed a, a fair amount into what, what ultimately amounts to, as I said, a 40 hour demo or two hour kind of pre prelude to the phantom pain um so as big boss you're called to an island in i think it's cuba yes it is uh to rescue uh chico, uh, chico. And, uh, chico and past who are were introduced in uh peace walker peace walker no, yeah the one i have played <laughs> yeah yeah so I, I, I barely played it so look yeah um, you find them, you rescue them, you find they've been tortured. It's it's honestly, it's, it's where the franchise kind of went. I don't know, like it, Kojima it seemed to lean more into shock value as opposed to, like, this is a personal opinion. I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's, it's just, you know, Chico and Paz are, at least they have the appearance of children. I think Paz is actually meant to be a grown woman. She just looks very young. Yeah, so she's, um, uh, she's a sleeper agent, I believe, who yeah. artificially um, made to look like she was 15 when she's 22. Yeah, and you can find tapes uh, around the environment, one of which I think Chico gives you when you find him, um, that give you kind of audio recordings of some of the torture they've been through. You find out a bit more information about what, what, what's happened on that island. Uh, and then once you rescued both in either order and that, that was kind of something they wanted to emphasize coming into the Phantom Pain was this, this idea is that you can tackle different objectives in different orders and that kind of thing you're essentially again they took the sandbox uh, formula from Snake Eater and just essentially just made this huge here's the, here's the complex here's the entire compound in in um, Ground Zeroes you can explore at your own pace and will and tackle objectives in any order you want and I, I, I will commend it for that I actually I think as a bite-sized experience Ground Zeroes is excellent I, I love that island I love the feel of it the aesthetic all of that um, but the story part I'm not too keen on so yeah once you rescue them both you're on your your helicopter um, and Paz starts freaking out like, oh, you gotta, gotta get it out of me and you're like what and it's like you find out they put a bomb in her womb there's two though isn't there yeah but that's the thing you don't know that is you you go to take it out and this is really uncomfortable scene where the the medic on your escape helicopter is like elbow deep in her womb trying to get out a bomb it's it really like, like like her entrails like yeah everything out. is dangling and it's like that's what i mean when i said kojima seemed to lean into the shock value he's like oh i'm going for the jugular here like i'm gonna make you uncomfortable yeah, and I, I don't have a problem with that. I just, for me, it didn't fit Metal Gear. Like Metal Gear Solid as a franchise has always teetered the balance between serious spy thriller and goofy fictional Saturday morning anime. Sorry, like fictional adventure. 
yeah it's it's it, it, it's fun but has serious like undertones and tells serious stories with serious characters but isn't afraid to get a bit goofy when the t- when the time calls for it but this was just leaning so like there's there is humor in ground zeros and ultimately phantom pain but it felt just a bit more removed from the franchise than i was accustomed to at the time i suppose mm-hmm. uh but yeah so you throw the bomb out the window happy days no womb bomb oh wait there's a second one so paz throws herself out Kablamo. uh big boss's face gets scarred and that's the last you see of big boss yeah. for a considerable amount of time yeah this yeah this bothered me like this this yeah. bothered me um so at the end of peace walker you actually hear um you you hear big boss giving this speech of saying that um we will not answer to any government we will not answer to any army we are soldiers without borders we are outer heaven and it stops that's it jesus like and and that kind of leads up into the into the um the events of what would happen with the original solid snake story you're, you're yeah. infiltrating outer heaven um which again we said we weren't going to talk about metal year one and two technically snake goes up against big boss in outer heaven in the first game yeah so like they the events we've just described eventually lead into those stories which affects metal year solid but i don't they're not as involved i don't think those stories because they were you know they were limited by the hardware at the time uh and everything about snake's personal connection to big boss is revealed in many years on and onwards yeah there wasn't that much of a of, of kind of character bonding in those original titles just because of the hardware that they were dealing yeah. with at the time which you can totally understand i think with metal gear solid one that's when it kind of really dives into like the zanzibar wars what outer heaven was and things like that i just yeah, want to read yeah exactly which we will dive into in the next video but like you look at the phantom pain and it's arguably the the best playing and looking metal gear game of the franchise like if they had that same kind of graphical fidelity for metal gear solid 3 even metal gear solid 4 they'd be timeless classics i think the problem that the phantom pain had was there was so little a story and so many side objectives that just didn't make sense to the narrative of what yeah. was going on. Do you know what I mean? Well, there's so many repeated missions. Yeah. You know, it was like, go, and they were numbered. Like they, they even did that. It was, say, destroy the heavy artillery unit one, destroy the heavy artillery unit two, destroy the heavy artillery unit three, rescue the prisoner one, rescue the prisoner two, rescue the prisoner three. And so much, so fucking much of that game is repeated objectives in slightly varying locations yeah um and it got old very quickly and a big part of the game is resource management and all that kind of stuff and i enjoyed the base building i enjoyed recruiting people to the crew and building up your resources that side of it i think was done quite well Mm. but the way you earn the in-game currency is so goddamn tedious yeah and you have to do these things to get story missions uh, because otherwise you'll, you, they either won't appear or you'll be woefully under-equipped if you don't do them. And then you'll you'll encounter certain elements of the game because of the free-form nature of uh, the way you can build the resources in your character. There are times you'll find yourself completely fucked in the story. Yeah. I remember distinctly when you're in the airfield and you're being attacked by the weird fucking nano zombie men. Oh, in, um, in South Africa, wasn't it? Yeah, in South Africa. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like fuck this mission because i hit my character the way i build up my character in most stealth games is around stealth and minimal casualties yeah so i had built my snake of i only had rubber bullet weapons on me uh, or tranquilizers or whatever i didn't have like heavy armor because i wasn't going in guns a blazing yeah. but there's a boss fight in this game where it's like if that's the approach you took you are fucked yeah these things hit like a truck they take virtually no damage from non-lethal options and i didn't have any particularly strong lethal options in my arsenal because that's not how i built my character so i had to restart the mission farm resources to invest in like a decent assault rifle or a decent sniper or a shotgun rocket launcher all that shit um you shouldn't have to do that though like as a player do you know what i mean like it's it's if you're building the game on how you want to approach it, then the yeah. missions should have been tailored to how you wanted to do it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like if I was playing Dark Souls 
and I was playing as a spellcaster, mm -hmm. mage character. I shouldn't have to completely respect my character to pyromancy or a knight kind of heavy hitter, two-handed kind of thing to beat a boss. Yeah, there should be. If if you give me the freedom to choose, don't limit my choices. Deus Ex Human Revolution. <laughs> um, it, so it, it was something that like considering how good the gameplay in Phantom Pain is and still is like fucking what seven years later seven eight years yeah nine yeah. nearly nine years yeah yeah like considering how fucking good that gameplay is because um it's insanely restrictive as well because of because of this and of course the story is restrictive what little story there is it's broken yeah. up into two acts for no reason uh, you know what, what bothered me about the whole thing about it actually reminds me of Metal Gear Solid 2 as a matter of fact where in Metal Gear Solid 2 they were creating trailers around the fact that like as Snake you would escape the actual sinking of the of the of the of the tank the tanker mission where you have a FAMAS and you'd be blasting down people and there'd be waves yeah. of people running after you and all this kind of thing when the trailers for Phantom Pain came out and it's one moment when you're in Africa and you see um you're in this kind of um underground prison kind of thing and there's children would hold out their hands and there's diamonds in them and then the next scene is is venom snake shooting but all he was doing was blowing the locks off like it's it's kind oh, of yeah. it's kind of leading you to believe that like he's he's unhinged now at this point at this point in time but you don't see that transition from because what we're told to believe is that big boss turned out to be this, the greatest anti-hero of all time and you don't really see that kind of transition you know like yeah this was supposed to bridge the gap between anti-hero uh metal gear naked solid 3 snake. yeah, yeah. An anti-hero naked snake and villain big boss yeah it was meant to bridge that gap that's what it was touted as when it was advertised it was like this is it this is the missing link they i think they literally said that in one of the ads yeah it's like this is the missing link that fills in the gap between this and this so but we were like i remember when that was coming out you and i were like oh fuck! like this is gonna be dark crazy like this is gonna be off the hook like it's gonna be and you know a big part of it as well is you know this was after games like spec ops the lion had come out you know games that kind of challenged the preconception that maybe you're not a great person as the gamer you know you're you're kind of doing bad shit yeah it's like this this could be really interesting as to play as the downfall of big boss mm. and be instrumental in it yourself you know you're a part of it you're with him the whole way and then the game just didn't finish that's, it, that's it, like I can only put it down to like the um the troubles that Kojima and Konami had that yeah, yeah. Just, they just said you know what fuck it it's too difficult we don't know where to fix we don't know where to finish so yeah. just have people play repeats of the same mission just in different locations and things like that it's just it bothered a big me. part of it it bothered Sorry? me it, no, it yeah, bothered, fair. you know I think the problem was you know we, we we're not flies on the wall in Konami we don't know all behind the scenes stuff like to be fair Kojima could potentially be very difficult to work with but generally from what we've heard about Konami they're woeful um yeah uh but I think we know it was around the time Silent Hills was cancelled Kojima was still working on Phantom Pain and after that after the cancellation of Silent Hills he was kind of like oh, I'm, I'm fucking done with these guys so he just didn't finish Phantom Pain. Now, I believe that like his last swan song for Metal Gear was he actually called himself Old Snake, in yeah, as in Metal Gear Solid Four. He's like, no, I want to do something else. Well, and that was true back in MGS Two. Yeah, uh, he had he had originally said Sons of Liberty is my last game on this franchise. Yeah, and then you know, unfortunately, the, the fan base, as fan bases can be, got quite toxic, and like, oh, where's my next fucking Metal Gear game? And then Snake Eater happened, and they're like, "Where's my next fucking Metal Gear game?" And he's like, "Where's That's my next? Fucking... Where's my next playthrough of Solid Snake?" Like, yeah, it's like, "Oh, who, yeah, you gave me a big boss. I want more Solid Snake." Yeah. So then, Guns of the Patriots happened, and like, I love that game, but it's a fucking mess. It isn't. <laughs> I love it. I adore that game. I could play that shit till the cows come home. But dear I think God. it improved. It improved an awful lot on what came before um, mm, Metal Gear Solid. Sure. Like, and it's great to see that. Like, and we will touch upon this in the next video. Like how the Patriot story got wrapped up, Eva's story got wrapped up, like everything kind of comes full circle with the Solid Snake story. But with Big Boss's story, it's still kind of open ended. Like if there wasn't a definitive moment in time that we've played that it's like, this is the end of Big Boss. Now we're moving on. Yeah. Arguably, Guns of the Patriots 
had a better coda for Big Boss's story than the game that was supposed to be the end of Big Boss's story. You know, because you have the encounter with Big Boss in Guns of the Patriots in the cemetery. Um, you know, there's this deep, oh. long conversation between Solid Snake and Naked Snake, and there's a mutual respect. It's, it's a really, as long as the cutscenes are in Guns of the Patriots, they're well done cutscenes. They're, they're gorgeous. They're well to look at. They are well written. There was too yeah. many of them, but they're well written. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're just like, I'm, I'm, just, I'm not even going to pick up the controller for the next yeah. hour. Yeah, uh, but that scene between Big Boss and Solid Snake or Old Snake mm. is really well done. It arguably bridges the gap between MGS three slash Peace Walker and the events of the modern era. I'm just being so selfish though because I would have loved to play that moment. Yeah, exactly. You no, know, I would have loved to play that moment, that transition, because all that we have is from Peace Walker until Ground Zeroes, and nothing kind of is really. You know, it doesn't stick out like yeah. with, with, with Guns of the Patriots. Like it was all done in a in a in a in a, in a cutscene. But I would have loved to have played a moment, like even at the end of Phantom Pain, um, Venom Snake is listening to a cu to a cassette message that Big Boss has left, and in the background you can hear gunshots going off and the alarm going off, and it's Solid Snake on his way in to kill Venom Snake. Yeah. But, but I just would have loved a moment to like just like. You know, we got so spoiled with Guns of the Patriots when we went back to Shadow Moses. Yeah. Oh. Do you know what I mean? So good. Like that was, the, but that was the bridge between Young Snake and Old Snake, and th in that moment, that's 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 what we had. I just would have loved to have that moment when, like, Big Boss was like just about to turn, and when he turned, like, just a, a moment there, like a little hour of gameplay or yeah. two hours of gameplay, you could maybe hike it off as DLC or something. I don't know how they would have done it, but. The thing as well with um, Grand Zero slash Phantom Pain, um, at the end of I know I haven't played Peace Walker, but at the end of Peace Walker, you know you've built up your base and your your team and all this kind of thing. The base building in that was like a trial run for what would eventually Phantom become Pain. the base building in Phantom Pain. Yeah. But the problem is, uh, Grand Zero ends with that all of your bases just being destroyed, so that you have to just start over. Yeah. And it's kind of I don't know. It felt a bit hollow. I, I know I haven't played Peace Walker. So it didn't affect me in a huge way, but imagine if you'd spend all that time on on Peace Walker building up your team and your base, and then it's like, ah, no, no, fuck you, you're doing it again. I think it would have been a little bit more impactful if if somehow you could transfer your save from the PSP onto the Sony Network Cloud, so oh, you can cool. see, oh, your best soldier that you had in Peace Walker gone, like your best sniper gone. Yeah. It would have been a little bit more impactful, but yeah, at a personal touch. Yeah, and I think that's what Phantom Pain did for, for the amount of flaws that it did have in terms of its story. Like, in that moment in Phantom Pain where the vocal parasites have like gotten onto your base and you have to go and gun your own staff members down and you see your honor dropping. Yeah. It was like, I, I, I sought out the best and the best that I have here aren't good enough and I have to take them out to stop the pathogen from spreading. Yeah, I think um, I think it's worth mentioning. As is probably fairly apparent, these videos are a free form. We're not we're not like adhering to a particularly rigid structure when we do our discussions. Uh, and it's worth noting as well that we haven't really touched on the Phantom Pain story the way we had with Snake Eater or even Peace Walker, because Phantom Pain's story is virtually non-existent. Yes, it's the intro section in the hospital superb sets it up really well the interactions with miller and ocelot excellent but then nothing really happens for 40 hours i mean I, i'm not even exaggerating it's literally 40 fucking hours You're right you meet quiet right. the sniper interesting character but not a lot happens with her until later in the game when she tries to kill you again um you get introductions like chronological introductions to characters like psycho mantis and liquid snake you see technically the end of Volgan's story even though as far as we were concerned his story had finished in snake eater yeah i, I didn't need more of him it just, because it, what, it didn't amount to anything what bothered me about the whole thing about seeing Volgan was the person who, who you're playing as in phantom pain is not snake so how would they have a memory of i, I know you can go into the whole he went under like severe psychoanalytic training or psychosis or whatever but like 
it 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 didn't click though. Like it was, if they wanted to to, to say that like Big Boss was off doing his own thing while the, a body double was doing his work, at least have moments when you're playing as Big Boss, so the the impact hits a bit harder. That yeah, yeah he's still dealing with a lot of like dark shit going on here. Like he's probably going to be seeing Volgan around the corner. He's probably going to be having the the weight of his actions being thrown upon him. But when you're playing as Venom or uh, yeah, as Ven- as Venom Punk- Snake, yeah, Venom Snake, yeah, it's like when you look at it from that kind of perspective, it's like it doesn't make any sense to the narrative because they don't know who Volgan is. They don't know who Psycho Mantis is. Or There's anything. no personal connection there. No personal connection. Um, like the meeting Liquid doesn't mean Dick because. No, I know they they kind of play with expectations there, where it's like, oh, you know, you 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 the player know, oh, big boss is Liquid's dad, and then they do like a DNA test, and oh no, you're not actually his dad. It's like, wait, what? Yeah. And I guess that's meant to hint at the fact that you're not actually playing as big boss. But I thought it was hinting more at the fact that it wasn't Liquid. Yeah, and I'm like, why would they have such a Liquid-like character and not have it be Liquid? Also, uh, the proposed Act Three for the game sounded amazing where essentially oh. it was Lord of the Flies. Yeah. Uh, Liquid Snake and us and um, Mantis. Psycho Mantis had taken the Sahel- in Metal Gear, Sahel Anthropus, yeah. to their own island and you had to bring your army to invade that island. Like That could have been really cool. Shame we never got it. Like the, the artwork and stuff for it was excellent and it was just another thread left unanswered, left unfinished. Yeah. Uh, and I... Like in characters like Skullface, I really didn't give a shit about. Like, eh, he's here. There wasn't even an equivalent like Foxhound, Dead Cell, or Cobra Unit. I know there was the the zombie Nano lads, yeah, yeah they but were they cool. were they had no personality, they had no character. Yeah, so that, that's that's a point of contention. Is like in in this in this timeline, it's it's like Zero and Big Boss were kind of like fighting against each other. And we will touch upon this in like the next edition because, yeah. you know, where Big Boss and Zero kind of parted ways after going under a disagreement about what the boss's will was. Um, the Skulls were like the, the the elite group of XOF. Yeah. Whereas Fox were the elite group of the CIA. You know, so there's there's that kind of, I mentioned at the start of the video, the, the two sides of the same coin, that kind of thing. But it's just... With the Phantom Pain, like I think they introduced too many things at once when so many things were left unwritten. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, it, like when Liquid was brought into it, I was like, this is not going to end properly. Immediately, I just knew it. Um, which is a shame because it, it'd be like now that we have Mantis and Liquid like being introduced into this story it does give agency to their relationship in the Metal Gear Solid 1. Like, it was always, like, they have quarrels amongst themselves, especially with the, the DARPA chief and things like that and, and what happened with the interrogation and yeah. things like this, you know. Um, it's it's what we got in the end. And unfortunately, yeah. it's not going to be rewritten, which is unfortunate. Oh, no, yeah, there's nothing we can do about it. it yeah. It's, I mean, I'm not even going to touch on Metal Gear Survive. Fuck that noise. Which um, Metal Gear Survive, Metal Gear Solid Survive, Metal Gear Survive. You know the the alternate reality. Oh yeah. They did, they did a kind of sequel to Phantom Pain with the game. It was, it was exclusively Konami, where it's like, as it turns out, at the beginning, at the end of Ground Zero, such beginning, it's of like Phantom an alternate Pain, reality or something. Yeah, where... your your crew somehow gets transported to another world, and you have to fight nano zombies and build like bases to survive and so I don't know it was dumb it was really fucking dumb it was Fortnite Metal Gear to be honest kind of it, it was no. like what even am I looking at here no, no. it was just very un Metal Gear and I'm not saying like, don't get me wrong I'm a firm believer that franchises should and can and should and can and can and should evolve and change over time Metal Gear Solid being a prime example you know the games have a clear path by which they evolve their gameplay over the years and even how they tell their stories to an extent. But this was just cash grab because they, they reused assets, they reused music environments as far as I'm aware. Like it was it was very much like, oh, let's flip a new game real quick and cash in on the Phantom yeah. Pain train. 
Exactly. And even then the pachinko machines that they were using of the re like remastered Metal Gear Solid 3 footage, yeah. like they, they actually build footage up just for a pachinko machine. It was like, oh, for God's sake, like this is terrible. Like imagine as well your first time playing through Metal Gear Solid 3 being on a fucking pachinko machine. Oh, stop. Like how does that, the game, the thing as well, the There's story. No gameplay like, it's no. just. And the story is like three fucking hours long. Oh, like yeah. just the story, like cutscenes that you unlock in, in Snake Eater, you can unlock a demo theater and watch all the cutscenes in a row. And it's like three hours long or some shit. Yeah. Fucking Lord of the Rings. Literally. Yeah. So I, I think it's funny. I think it's interesting that in terms of opinions, we've discussed Phantom Pain more than we did with Snake Eater. Uh, yeah. Because Snake Eater, we were talking more kind of general experience and like the story itself and the gameplay and that, this, that, and the other. But Phantom Pain is so void of any real personality or content i could sum up phantom pain which has been it was it was the best looking metal gear game and the best oh, yeah. playing metal gear game that's it yeah you don't play that game for the story no for me maybe it, maybe but... and i don't want to ever tell people how to enjoy things i don't know how you enjoy things maybe you love phantom pain story yeah absolutely there. Yeah. and if you do more power to you i'm sorry you didn't get the finale to that story you wanted yeah um it's just it was disappointing yeah, it, it's no other way to describe it. It was just, it was supposed to be something and, and it just wasn't. And, and like, um, that's not even like Kojima's fault or anything like that. There was just, I think he was given, he was given too, too few resources and little time. And of course there was the online stuff. And I would imagine a lot of, the, I, I could be wrong, but I would imagine Konami were like, hey, everyone's playing shit online. Cram that in there and make, make some cash off microtransactions yeah um because i believe like to get the like the, the secret best ending you had to dismantle nuclear bases around the world and yeah in so you could invade other people's outer havens or whatever outer heaven yeah shit. uh i tried it it was fine I, i'm not a big multiplayer guy as it is but you know the means by which it works i think it was functional and i liked the concept of it but I just, it seems like it took away from the development of, you know, interesting side missions or an actual plot. <laughs> Fucking, sorry, I'm real salty about that game. I, I, I have it. Like, I have that game. And I'll download from time to time and play it again because I think the game like it is. is the, the, the gameplay is fantastic. The, the real-time weather effects are brilliant. Um, being dropped in different locations on, yeah. on one big map is brilliant. Um, I have a lot of gripes about that one game, but for, for what we're discussing with Big Boss's story, it just doesn't fit into the narrative. But I think what we're, I'm really looking forward to discussing that we've kind of highlighted the intro of The Blood of the Snake. Yeah. The next video is going to be just brilliant, where we, we follow on from the, from the impact and what is going to happen from Big Boss's story and where he is now and what happens from the end of uh, Snake Eater on to, up until Metal Gear Solid 1. That's what I'm really looking forward to and where oh, we yeah. continue on these, these videos from. Um, but Shepard, listen, absolutely delighted to be doing these videos with you once again, my friend. Thank you so, so, so much for joining me once again. Really, really appreciate it. Um, for all of you guys interacting with the channel, leaving the comment here and there, even liking, subscribing. We really, really, really appreciate it. There's three of us doing this. It's myself, Joker, my co-host, Shepard, and our wonderful, wonderful artist, uh, Dave Murphy, who also has his YouTube channel. We'll be dropping a link in the description below. Be sure to keep an eye out for new updates. Uh, but, si plug. <laughs> <laughs> but signing off on the safe point, ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you so much. I have been your host, Joker. I've been your co-host, Shepard. Take care, guys. Look after yourself. Thank you.